it's a, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. All set? Okay. I'm sure. Welcome. Welcome to ETSU Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Dr. Brown is here. He's lecturing us today. For a quick introduction, Dr. Brown is Professor of Psychiatry at Associate Chairman of Veteran Affairs, ETSU, and Research Teaching Consulting Psychiatrist at James H. Quillen VA Medical Center. He went to undergraduate at the University of Rochester, as well as medical school at University of Rochester School of Medicine, and completed his residency at Wright State University and U.S. Air Force Integrated Residency in Psychiatry. He was a staff psychiatrist at Wilford Hall Medical Center, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas for a number of years. He's also served as Director of Psychiatric Research at James H. Quillen VA Medical Center, the Chief of Psychiatry at James H. Quillen VA Medical Center, Program Officer for the VA Central Office in Healthcare Outcomes Office of Health Equity, and has been a staff psychiatrist at VA Medical Center and James H. Quillen. He has over 150 publications on a variety of psychiatric topics, specializing, from what I was reading, forensics, transgender issues, and all sorts of topics. He has numerous presentations. There's, I lost count multiple times reading through his CV. And he's got numerous book chapters as well on gender identity disorders and sexual dysfunction. So, Dr. Brown. Thanks so much. First of all, I want to apologize for being late. It helps to look at a self-winding watch when the watch is wound, as opposed to when it's not wound. So I take full responsibility for my tardiness. Um, basically what I want to cover today is um, that we're at the three-year point in a research project um, that is near and dear to my heart and is really the pinnacle of my research career lifetime and quite proud of what we've been able to do with a very small number of people um, and access to a very large database. Um, so basically there, there'll still be enough time to cover what I want to cover today. Um, I recently got back from my fourth trip to Africa, and this is a picture of a herd of giraffes crossing the Luangwa River in Zambia. And the river is so low at this point, you can see it doesn't look like even a river, um, but they're able to cross without any difficulty. It's just an amazing sight to see that happen. So I'm, I want to give you a summary, so I'm not going to go into great detail about any of the individual papers that have come out of this um, three-year effort up to this point, but to just give you an idea of uh, really the, the state of the art on the largest protocol that's ever been done with transgender people in the world. And this, th some of these data were actually presented last week, um, some of them for the first time, to uh, the Department of Defense at Walter Reed, where I was invited to help train um, 400 people from around the world uh, in the Department of Defense on how to take care of transgender troops effective October 1st. So if you're thinking the training was last week, was the first training, and on October 1st, it's going live for treatment, including cross-sex hormones and psychotherapy, et cetera, within the Department of Defense, you might be thinking the timeline is kind of tight and you would be right about that. So this is uh, the, the modified de declaration of conflict of interest. Um, you can see it there. Um, although this topic has absolutely nothing to do with Janssen or Synovion, that has been added in here. Um, and most importantly, no small animals were harmed in the creation of this presentation. So in terms of the background on transgender health research, um, particularly in a military or VA context, which is the focus of the work that I've been doing for the last three decades, um, it's pretty limited, uh, largely because you have an invisible or a stigmatized population. It's not like people in the military have been coming out in large numbers um, to clinicians and saying, hey, I'm transgender and I'm a sergeant in the army. Please um, sign me up for your latest study. So there are a lot of research gaps um, that have existed in this topic for a long time. And the literature on this is really quite limited um, all the way up to about 2013. Um, you can see one of our ex-residents, Dr. McDuffie, I included him on a a paper um, that we published in 2010, uh, which at that point was the largest N ever studied of 
transgender people in a military or VA context. That was just 70 people. And you can see, you'll see um, the dramatic increase that we've been able to um, affect well, now that we have, now that I got access to a much larger database. And this is the paper that uh, we published in 10. So th the summary out of that paper that was, I think, important was to realize even in the late 80s going all the way through to 2010, there are, number one, a lot of transgender people serving in the military, and the estimates are somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 people are, on, are in the active duty force right now, including active reserves. And many of those people um, do take cross-sex hormones while they're on active duty and have been for decades, ever since people have been able to access friends birth control pills, street drugs, black market stuff, whatever. So this has been going on for decades and decades, um, so it's not, not a new issue at all. And in that initial study that we had with just 70 people, um, you can see the, the, a common theme in all the work that's been done with transgender populations, whether it's survey monkey stuff, if you think that's valid. I, I always am suspect of survey monkey studies when it comes to things like this. But nonetheless, they've reported somewhere in the neighborhood of 41 to 42 percent. So we're in the same basic area, um, meaning that it's much larger than you would, you would uh, hope to see. But again, small population. So what's more important is to look at a much larger population and see if this uh, pans out when you have a larger N. So for those who have worked in the VA for a while, in 2011, there was a 180-degree sea change uh, in VA policy nationwide, um, largely due to the efforts of the current uh, administration under, Dr., uh, under President Obama, um, essentially suggesting strongly that the VA uh, reconsider its policy of not taking care of its transgender troops, of which there are probably 134,000 veterans, living veterans, who are transgender by latest estimates. So it wasn't like the VA just all of a sudden decided in 2011 that, hey, uh, we're going to be enlightened as a government agency and we're going to um, all of a sudden open up uh, all of our services to transgender veterans. It's not how it worked. It was really a, a top-down political process that uh, fortunately I was involved with from the very beginning in 2010 uh, going forward and have had a lot of input into the uh, national changes in this regard. So um, it's been updated in 13, and it's, it's also being updated currently, and I'm still on the committee to update the third update within a six-year period of time. So these are some of the issues that are, that are in the mandates, and how that's important to the research is um, being able to find people and having people talk about their transgender status was greatly facilitated by the fact that they could come in and talk to their, their clinicians about their transgender status with some hope that they could get care. So um, shortly after I got this promotion to central office to work with the Office of Health Equity, um, myself and, and one other person, Dr. Jones, who is a sociologist by training, um, put together the Mountain Home Transgender Veteran Research Protocol, which is a, uh, a live and well protocol with ETSU and VA IRB here today. So it's three years old now, three years and a couple months. And <clears throat> Our purpose in developing the protocol was for the first time to create a large cohort of transgender people using an electronic health record so that we could do uh, large-scale studies that no one really in the world has been able to do. Um, the only similar efforts that have been done have been done in Europe, in small European countries like Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden, where the entire population of the country is smaller than the number of veterans that we have in the U.S. So they've been able to do it with a smaller number than, we've, than we have access to in our uh, electronic records. The other thing that we wanted to do, instead of just doing descriptive studies, which are interesting if that's the state of the science for a particular topic, but what do you compare it to? So if you find out that 40% of people are suicid suicidal, is that a large number or a small number? Well, it depends on what your comparison group is, right? So we were able to put together a very large control group. Um, and of course, you have nat national norms. But more importantly, having a matched control group within the same population, in this case being veterans, um, would put this type of study into a, a position where others have not really been able to do it uh, anywhere in the US. And there are implications, obviously, for 
um, changing our policies going forward and, and changing some of the clinical offerings based on the findings of, of some of this work. So these are some of the projects um, so far that we have um, come out of this over the last three years. And um, most of these are published or in the process of being published. And I'm going to touch on not all of these because of the time. Uh, but the, uh, I'll highlight some of the ones that I think are, are most interesting and that I've not presented uh, here before. So obviously suicide kind of raises its head as being an important thing to study in a veteran population specifically, but in a transgender population based on our earlier work showing that high rate. Um, <clears throat> So this first paper we looked at, uh, what's the prevalence of gender identity disorder, which at that time was the diagnosis pre-DSM-5, where now, as we all know, is gender dysphoria, essentially the same diagnosis. And as you can see, the line um, is, the slope of this line is pretty substantial. Of course, the pointer does not work here. But um, if you go from 2011 forward, which we didn't do in this paper, but have looked at since, the line actually is not linear. It actually is... Uh, more logarithmic in terms of the increase in uh, uh, new GID diagnoses. Some of those are from, for people who are already in the system, and probably a majority, though, are new accessions to the VA, um, unique veterans who have not come to the VA before because they weren't welcome to come to the VA before and stayed away from VA care and now uh, feel like, well, let's see, it's worth a chance. I might get my hormones there for free. I might get my labs, which is kind of an expensive thing to do on your own. So it's really been quite a, a significant change. Um, since we don't have specific data on transgender people in the United States, uh, we don't know how many there are in the VA either. So we just have estimates. Um, in the 80s, I developed this theory called flight into hypermasculinity, which would um, suggest, uh, based on this theory, that there would be substantially more people, a higher prevalence of transgender birth sex males in the military than you would expect by chance alone. So that was a theory based on the first paper that I wrote on this in 1988. Um, and we now have the numbers to actually show that that theory seems to hold some water. So when we look at our, um, our numbers, um, we have two to three times the number that you would expect based on population match controls, which is pretty consistent with what um, I, I've been seeing in my clinical work since, since around 85 or so. So um, obviously we're talking about people with clinical diagnoses, which is not to be confused with the population of transgender people. There's probably eight to 10 times more transgender people uh, without a clinical diagnosis than there are those with a clinical diagnosis at any point prevalence in time. Uh, so we're focusing on the people that we can find um, in the medical records. So that's people with clinical diagnoses. So what we found in this initial uh, swatch uh, at the data uh, was roughly a 20 times higher rate of suicidal behavior, not com necessarily completed suicides, but suicidal behavior compared to matched uh, veteran population. And that turns out to be, in 2010 anyway, 202 per 100,000, which is really quite a uh, stunningly high number. So in the next um, study, we sought to look at actual suicide in addition to all-cause mortality. So are transgender veterans dying at a different rate and or from different causes than match control veterans? Um, or is it just what you would expect to see? So this is the purpose of this study. And on this chart, what you can see is the uh, ICD causes of death. And these are confirmed causes of death from, from objectively obtainable databases from the government, not from the VA. So they have to have hard endpoint of death confirmed, right? So that's on the left with the ICD. 10 code groups, then you have our transgender cohort and the next set of columns, the U.S. population, and then I threw Tennessee in just for the heck of it, uh, using the latest data that I could find at the time was 2011. And one of the things that you might notice is <clears throat> that these infectious and parasitic diseases 
um, is substantially higher ranked in the deceased transgender veterans than in the U.S. population or in Tennessee. Any ideas why that might be? This is the audience participation part. Infectious diseases. What infectious disease might be substantially higher in a transgender population? HIV AIDS, right. HIV AIDS, number one health disparity in transgender people. And that has been replicated, you'll see in a following subsequent slide. But that is so much higher. The disparity is so great in a transgender population that it kicked it all the way up to position number six based on HIV AIDS. So in this study, we had um, almost 10% of our population were confirmed dead over a 10-year span with an average age of death of 64.2. Um, and we talked about the rankings of the causes of death being somewhat different. And about 5% of those deaths were due uh, to suicide, completed suicide. Again, with all the issues involved with causes of death data, Nonetheless, um, we have that, and that's usually considered an underreported number because accidents, suicides are often coded as accidents by coroners, um, and coroners can be an insurance salesman, uh, it can be anybody. A, a coroner is an elected position in counties, and they frequently have no medical training whatsoever. So interestingly, the average age at suicide death, even when you compared to other veterans who suicided, was substantially younger, so 49 versus almost 55. So a substantial difference in age. So in, in the kind of main study uh, that came out in this uh, suite of studies published in this year, 2016, you can see our cohort was 5,135 transgender veterans, um, which is, again, the largest cohort studied uh, in this population. And I'll just touch quickly on the methods. So I've been talking about matched. So we did a three to one matching. So that means we have, if we have 5,135, multiply that by three, and we have 15,400 roughly uh, matched veteran controls on a variety of demographic parameters. So this is a really large study. Um, and the, the ability to, to match really uh, adds substantially to the meaningfulness of the data that we have. So, see the, the mean age, uh, typical of a veteran population was about 56 with a pretty wide standard deviation around that. Um, like in virtually every study of transgender phenomenon, whether it's military or, or non-military, the vast majority of people in studies are non-Hispanic whites. So in, in this graph, and you won't be able to read this in the cheap seats and that's fine, it's just to get a, an overall gestalt of what we're seeing in this uh, forest plot. And what we have on the left is a variety of mental and medical health conditions. Then you have a line down the middle that's very faint. Um, but that line is basically, if you're on that line or your confidence interval uh, straddles that line, that means there is no health disparity in one population compared to the other. If you're all the way to one side or the other with no overlap, I don't know if the, does the laser pointer actually even work? Okay, it does, all right. So the, this line right here is the line where everything to the right of that without an overlap is a health disparity against transgender people. And everybody, every line over here that doesn't overlap this line of effect size of one is a health disparity in favor of transgender veterans if you wanna look at it that way. And there's only, as you can see, really only one um, that meets that, and that's breast cancer, and I'll have a lot to say about that shortly. So looking specifically at the things that were on that chart, as I mentioned earlier, the HIV, you can see, is by far and away the number one health disparity at five. I mean, that is, that's not small. That is a really, really large differential. Um, and, and duplicates, replicates essentially what's been seen in uncontrolled studies in civilian populations as well. Um, so you go down the list, you can see these disparities. The, the lowest disparity is chronic renal disease at a 40% difference, 40% disparity in 
against the transgender population, but every single one of these is significantly clinically as well as statistically um, much worse for the transgender veterans compared to matched veterans. Um, going through more medical diagnoses, you can see the list there and I won't belabor it because you can read it and they're all higher. If you look at the psychiatric conditions, um, depression comes very close to being um, as high a disparity as HIV disease, 4.6 compared to 5. So it's in the, the mental, mental health diagnoses and psychiatric diagnoses, by far and away depression is the number one uh, comorbid diagnosis. Uh, serious mental illness, which is kind of a amalgam term that the VA, I didn't make this term up, this is how you can search, uh, essentially puts together uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, uh, delusional disorder, brief psychotic reactions, and the other things that are in ICD-10 all into one group of, of SMI. You can see that that's substantially higher as well. PTSD, almost three times in this population, um, with the thinking being that a lot of these transgender veterans um, come into the military uh, to purge their transgender feelings so they actually join up and volunteer for much more hazardous duty than the average person who joins or enlists in the military. So they'd be more likely to get TBIs, more likely to get shot at, blown up, and have PTSD. So some of the things not on those slides that came out in this work as well, um, incarceration history, which we did a whole paper on that as well, um, is substantially higher, and that replicates what you see in the civilian population of transgender people as well. Uh, transgender vets of color have substantially higher health disparities, and we did a separate paper on racial disparities in this match control group as well. And not surprisingly, if you are transgender and non-white, your health disparities go up compared to being just transgender or just being a veteran. So com with every comparison group, if you're a transgender person of color, you are in much worse shape um, medically and mental health-wise. Military sexual trauma, or more, more accurately, reporting of military sexual trauma is substantially higher as our lifetime rates of, of homelessness. So I want to talk a little bit about the breast cancer study because this, this one has gotten a lot of um, interest uh, not just in the VA, but internationally, because we don't have very good data on transgender people over decades of time who may or may not have been treated with cross-sex hormones. So while we're telling people in the VA that uh, transgender health is really just health care um, and that people in primary care should be doing the bulk of transgender health care as other types of health care, that's really the VA model. Um, there are many people who are reticent to prescribe cross-sex hormones um, for a variety of reasons, uh, many of which have nothing to do with science, but nonetheless, the argument comes up often, well, I don't really know what's going to happen if I you know, use estrogen in this birth sex male you know, 20 years down the road or 10 years down the road or 50 years down the road. So an obvious question to ask of a database like this that goes back to the 90s is, what about transgender people? Do they have breast cancer at higher, lower rates than match controls? So that's one of the things that we did. And I have to say that this was probably the, the paper that was accepted fastest of any paper I've written in my life, literally within four weeks of when I hit submit in the online submission process, this paper was published online ahead of print, four weeks in a cancer journal. Because this is a hot topic in transgender health. So it's been looked at in, in the Netherlands really closely for a long time. Again, smaller number of people, um, and they have about a 20-year uh, history of looking at it, um, and they have some results um, that they've been publishing every five years or so. So this is what we came up with with our group. We had 10 patients confirmed with breast cancer total. Of those, seven were birth sex female or trans men, and three were birth sex males. Two of them were trans women, and one was a gender dysphoric person with transvestic fetishism. So a cross-dresser with gender, intermittent gender dysphoria, um, who may or may not have taken hormones, um, was the third person uh, in the birth sex male population. Now, a little more than half of those people got cross-sex hormones, CSH, from the VA during their their life. 
So when you look at the incidence of breast cancer and you compare it to um, uh, SEER data, which is a breast cancer database uh, that's been ongoing in the United States for quite some time, it's the best comparator. Um, the incidence that you would expect is about 15 per 100,000, and we ended up with 20 per 100,000, and when you compare those statistically as standard incident ratios, there was no difference between the two populations. So the thing that we did that's different from what the Amsterdam group has done, the Amsterdam group continues to, com to look at doses of hormones that they, that they prescribe in their clinic and try to make dose-response relationship comments. The problem with that is you can get hormones, there's leakage. You can get hormones from so many different places, and even if you're getting them free and prescribed by the clinic in, uh, in Amsterdam or free and prescribed at the VA, many patients in, in the transgender community feel that, well, if what the doctor's giving me is good uh, for breast development, then twice that must be twice as good. So I'll supplement that with what I get online or from my friends or double up and say that I lost my prescription. So there's a lot of supplementation of dosages. So my contention is, and, and no one can prove this wrong, is that in no population can you actually know the doses of cross-sex hormones that any, that any transgender population is taking. So coming up with a dose-response relationship is really an interesting and important question that, in my view, is not answerable. So the way we did this study was whether you took hormones or not, that's really not the issue. It's the fact that you're a transgender person followed for 20 years or whatever the period of time for that individual was, and to see if you develop breast cancer, whether or not you've taken hormones or not, because we can't know how much you actually have taken. So largest study, not the longest duration. The Amsterdam group has the longest duration, um, and our numbers actually are not different from the numbers in Amsterdam. So we have uh, consistency uh, across both sides of the Atlantic, again, for a largely white population. So fair questions asked are, would it vary by race? Can't answer that question. The numbers aren't large enough. Um, and we can't answer the question about dose. And of course, types of medications have changed over the decades. So that is a further confound in asking this question. But again, if you're asking the very simple question, is breast cancer more common in transgender veterans than in other veterans or in another, re another reference population? The answer to that currently is no, it's not. We did have one additional case right before um, I left doing clinical care at, at the VA, trans woman in uh, late in 2015, very early stage disease, um, was treated uh, successfully and is on um, basically maintenance monitoring at this point. Um, the only other comment I'll say in the breast cancer study is that the three birth sex males who presented all presented with end-stage disease, untreatable, large, firm tumors that had already metastasized. So they weren't doing breast self-exams, and they came in untreatable. Whereas the birth sex females, um, none of them came in with late-stage disease, and all of them were able to be treated. So even though we're, there are no data to suggest that breast cancer is more likely, obviously breast cancer happens. So the, the clinical implication and takeaway is breast self-examination, whether you're birth sex male or birth sex female as a trans person, is really pretty important. And getting mammographies following the same uh, recommendations that uh, other birth sex women in particular would have would be the, the suggested uh, not necessarily um, evidence-based uh, recommendation, but nonetheless, that's the current clinical recommendation. So another valid question is just because the VA makes a, a sweeping change in policy, just as the Department of Defense did, effective in a week and a half, does that mean that people are all all in free, you know, now that you've changed the policy, it's all good, you know, we're all just going to come out of the woodwork and we're going to get our free hormones now? Um, not necessarily, because there may be other reasons why people don't come in for care or don't access the care. So you can make all the policy changes you want, but it's, it's, a, it's basically a, a public health question to ask, 
are people actually accessing the care that you have made available by fiat? So obviously the VA was unprepared for this change and the Department of Defense is really unprepared for this change. I'm sitting there last, last Wednesday in front of the person who signed this 13-page directive uh, in, that's Department of Defense-wide and essentially criticizing the policy and saying that the Department of Defense isn't even close to ready uh, to implement this policy in two weeks. Um, and here's all the reasons why. And she followed my talk with her first comment being, the Department of Defense is absolutely ready to implement this policy in two weeks. And then proceeded to demonstrate why she was absolutely wrong in her first statement. It was an interesting time. So um, how do you figure out, now that we're four or five years down the line, whether transgender veterans are actually accessing transgender-specific health care? Because using the electronic health record, people coming in just because they have a gender dysphoria diagnosis and they're being seen for hypertension doesn't mean that they're accessing transgender health care. They could still be getting their transgender-specific health care somewhere else or not at all, right? It's due to other barriers uh, to access, like prescribers who refuse to prescribe cross-sex hormones, which still happens in the VA. So examples like that. So just because you have more diagnoses does not mean you have more treatment. And again, this is a public health question, not necessarily a strictly clinical question. So again, looking at um, a similar graph that we looked at in our previous public publication, but updated through 15, you can see that there is an increase in the prevalence of gender identity disorder and it's three other common diagnoses that we include under the umbrella of transgender for the purposes of this definition. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean access to care. So the only way, at least that I can figure out, to determine whether people are accessing transgender-specific health care is to look at cross-sex hormones. So what we did is we looked specifically at estrogens, the whole class of drug estrogens, then spironolactone, which, as we all know, is a really lousy antihypertensive for the most part, but has this interesting uh, property of being a peripheral testosterone blocking agent. So that's one of the, the downsides if you're taking it for hypertension is that uh, your testosterone level, if you're a birth sex male, is going to go down uh, in a clinically meaningful way. So that property is capitalized upon in transgender health to um, add to the regimen of people, birth sex males who are receiving estrogens, to lower the dose of estrogen, which is the nasty drug in terms of side effects, and spiro, other than monitoring potassium, generally not a big deal. So there's not a lot of reasons why people would get spironolactone other than that it's being used in a cross-sex hormone regimen. So you can see the very steep rise in the amount of spironolactone use. You can see the very steep rise in estrogen use in birth sex males and the very steep rise in um, testosterone use in this population in general. So that suggests, I think, pretty unambiguously that people are, in fact, accessing transgender-specific health care. So it's not just that it's available. People are accessing it in reality. So a second question that we ask, and this is unpublished data at this point, the uh, second question that we ask as we comb the, the pharmacy records, which are really quite good in the VA, is if you start to provide appropriate treatment for transgender people um, who have clinically significant problems of gender dysphoria with cross-sex hormones as opposed to treating the symptoms of gender dysphoria, which in general are depression, anxiety, irritability, sleeplessness, things like that, um, and not use symptomatic treatments like antidepressants, second generation antipsychotics to use as a kicker when your antidepressant doesn't work for the gender dysphoria that you're trying to treat wrongly, um, when anti-anxiety agents and uh, sedative hypnotics if you start providing the right treatments, will the other treatments in the population go down uh, as an association at least? And I think if you look at these, and we've analyzed these statistically, there is in fact a statistically significant downturn in these symptomatic drugs in this population. Of course, the next step would be to do it 
linking it to specific patients, right? Because this is a population study. So in the population, we can say the, the transgender veteran population is, is definitely accessing specific care, and the population as a whole is getting less treatment with these three classes of drugs. And when you compare that to the veteran population as a group, these are very distinct patterns. So this is, I don't have the, the, the graph on it, but this is a very distinct pattern that differs uh, substantially from the, the veteran population as a group. There's been really no change in these graphs or in these graphs if you look at control group or the, or the whole VA as a group. Okay, so I've already talked about that. So in, in terms of uh, what we have, um, health disparities, key take-home points, health disparities in this population are global. It's not just medical, it's also mental health, and these have obvious implications for, for clinical care. Some of those clinical implications are screenings for substance use disorders, suicidality, HIV disease, depression, um, that's what these data say. And uh, these data also support the VA's approach, which as the only psychiatrist member of the, the committees that developed the pharmacy um, protocol that's in national use, saying that you can't access cross-sex hormones without having a mental health evaluation. Now that may seem obvious when you look at data like this, but I can tell you that the standard in the community in many of the largest cities in the U.S. is to skip that whole step and just use what's called an informed consent model where people just come in and say, well, you know, you've given me a fact sheet about, you know, how I could get blood clots in my legs and I could get a stroke and I could die if I take estrogens. Um, and I'm, telling, I'm just telling you that my mental health is fine and I don't, I'm not suicidal, so I'll just sign here and I, then I walk out the same day with a prescription. That goes on every day in clinics in the United States. And I'm saying not only is that not evidence-based, it goes against the best evidence that we have that suggests that people need significant physical screenings as well as mental health screenings, uh, in particular prior to starting these very powerful treatments, which are cross-sex hormones. Um, obviously, the VA needs to continue to build clinical capacity. We're now five years into training, and I'm still involved with the national training of teams and VAs all over the country. We've got about 60 teams trained but it's taken five years to do that. The Department of Defense's timeline to, to do complete training of all the services at all levels is nine months. It's taken us five years and we're not done. But they're suggesting they're gonna do it in nine months. So that'll be interesting, because they don't have a training program yet. So obviously limitations here. Um, having self-identified gender identity data would greatly aid researchers of the future. Once I'm dead and buried on my farm, um, you'll be able to look back starting in 2016, hopefully by the end of this calendar year, where there will be, in fact, um, self-identified gender identity fields um, that I've been working on with a, a small group of other people to get in place, VA-wide, so that every veteran coming into the system will have a birth sex field as opposed to just a sex or a gender field. Those fields will be changed completely to birth sex, which is simply defined as what is the sex on your birth certificate. And in the United States, it's only M or F. That's your only choices and it's completely objective. It's not an opinion. So that's the first field and then self-identified gender identity would be the second field and that has implications for the, uh, the clinical reminders that come up for each of these patients. If you work at the VA and you want to know everything there is to know about transgender stuff in the VA, this is the SharePoint that, again, a group of us have worked on over the last five years. And this is only available using a VA.gov website, which is really unfortunate because even the Department of Defense can't access the treasure trove of information that is all stored in this one place. And then, of course, WPATH.org, where the standards of care are. You can download those for free about 120 pages with 20 pages of references. Um, and I give a copy to every patient that, um, that I see. And this is a set of references um, that cover the material that I've covered here as well as some of the other background papers as well. So this, is, this will be part of the, uh, the record, I guess, because I have a copy of this program. So on that note, we've got a couple minutes for questions. And again, I apologize for being late.
was curious to see if you have any comments regarding, I know that there was a recent news report stating that Bradley Manning has undergone surgical transgender procedures. And right. I know that that's a policy potentially moving forward for the VA in terms of approving more of those procedures being done. Right. Is that something where you've seen data in terms of reducing depression and some of these comorbid psychiatric conditions related with that after, after undergoing those procedures? Okay. So a lot of stuff in what you just said. Um, Chelsea Manning, is, which is her current name, um, a case that I was not able to be directly involved with because of my status as a VA employee. So my friend, Dr. Etner, took on that case, but I got to train the people who in turn provided the cross-sex hormones in Leavenworth for Manning, uh, who is the first federal um, prisoner to get hormones. And as you alluded to last week, actually, the, the, day, the day that I was speaking to uh, the people at Walter Reed, that afternoon is when the news came out that uh, Manning was approved for uh, sex reassignment surgery, date uncertain, surgeon unknown, at some point in the future, um, w which will be the first federal prisoner to be approved for that. There's only one civilian prisoner approved for that, and that's in California, and that surgery has not happened either. Um, <clears throat> so important case uh, in terms of precedence being set. Um, your larger question is, does sex reassignment surgery improve outcomes, probably? Is that your, the larger question? Yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, it's a, my, my personal answer, based on 35 years of doing this, is absolutely, if you pick the right patients. And the WPATH guidelines are the guidelines that I've always used. Um, and following those guidelines, I've not had any patients um, regret having surgery or have any any negative outcomes uh, in terms of uh, mental health status uh, or quality of life status. There are a few percent of people who do, but it's much more likely that people do better, depending on how you want to define better, um, than not. But it's, it's an impossible question to study in a controlled way. I guess part of my question is, I know that for transgender uh, reassignment is a significantly different step than hormone therapy. And is there data out there that suggests that the transgender uh, sex reassignment surgery. sexual reassignment has better outcomes comparatively outside the VA? Is there anything like that? Well, that's, that's the question I just answered, actually. Okay. You, can't, you can't control it, and there's no way to do a controlled study of people who got sex reassignment versus not. Um, we only have... 50 or 60 years of clinical experience, which is also evidence. It's considered low quality evidence, but nonetheless, it is evidence. I was going to ask, at what point have, um, have the, most of these veterans been diagnosed with um, GID, uh, gender dysphoria? And then number two question is, um, I guess like an epidemiology question, how many veterans um, have service connection for gender dys dysphoria? Oh, okay, that's an easy one to answer, zero. Nobody has service connection for gender dysphoria because all, anybody who had gender dysphoria, gender identity disorder, who was identified and thrown out of the military, which there are thousands of those people, they were all done under administrative uh, regulations and not medical regulations. So the answer to that is zero. Appreciate your attention. <laughs>